Well, obviously in the time given, it's not possible to go into every detail. But um, the events in North Africa and the Middle East have shaken the world. And they've set in motion a process um, which is challenging imperialism in the whole region and giving a different perspective to workers around the world. Because until recently, the media presented the Arab world as dominated by Islamic fundamentalism, despotic regimes, and presented the Arab peoples as somehow <coughs> conservative, more backward, etc. You can see that when the Tunisian revolution erupted, uh, they were all taken by surprise. One of the reasons they gave was that um, Tunisia is like the West. It's very westernized. Um, actually, that contains rather a racist content in that if they like the West, they can't have a revolution because we don't have revolutions in the West. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the, Egypt, the Tunisian revolution was actually the spark that lit the Egyptian revolution actually in terms of its weight within the Arab world, even, even more important, Egypt has always been considered a leader nation in the Arab world for its weight, size of population, its industrial development. Um, and for 30 years or more, Egypt had been in a, in a, in a trajectory which was, had brought it more and more into line with Western imperialism. Let's not forget that under Nasser, Egypt swung very much towards the Soviet Union in terms of sphere of influence and also nationalized a significant part of its economy under NASA. Since uh, Sadat came to power and then was assassinated and then Mubarak took over, what we've seen is 30 years of a different process to that under NASA, which is more and more privatizations, more and more pushing the state out of the economy, and attacks also on, on, on welfare, such as subsidies on basic foods, but this is a phenomenon we've seen across the whole of the Arab world, but not just the Arab world. This is something that imperialism has done to Latin America, to Africa, and to Asia. It's actually part, you can't understand the whole thing unless you look at the crisis of capitalism that started in the, in the 70s, and I don't want to go into that in detail, but just to say that the different ways in which they, they, they climbed out of that crisis Partly the Soviet Union collapsing in China moving to capitalism helped, but they also forced open the markets of all the former colonial countries because they desperately needed new markets for the um, industries, for the, for the economies of the advanced capitalist countries. And one of the ways they did this was to reduce or eliminate tariff barriers in the, the, the former colonial countries, forcing them to open up their markets to the advanced capitalist countries. This created the situation which has led to revolution. 30 years of these economic policies have led to this, to this situation. Now, think about it. There's a parallel to the policies they carried out in the Arab world, which is what have they been doing in the advanced capitalist countries? Practically the same. Attacks on welfare, cuts in spending, privatization, while at the same time, of course, protecting their own economies, like the European Union is one big customs union that protects their own market. But similar policies, and it's not by chance that before the Arab Revolution erupted, we had a huge movement in Europe, a massive movement in France against attacks on pensions, powerful general strike in Portugal, general strike in Spain, now in Spain, look at the youth of Spain, copying the Egyptians. Egyptians have become the vanguard of, of the world uh, movement of the working class, even have an effect here in the states in Wisconsin, where obviously the movement wasn't because of the Egyptians, it was because of the attacks carried out in the United States, but they took many of the slogans and, um, uh, I mean, they, you know, fight like an Egyptian, Hosni Walker, human uh, workers' rights are human rights, all this kind of, there was a connection. So what we see, the Arab Revolution isn't just an Arab Revolution, it's part of a bigger process. At this moment in time, of course, it's the most advanced point. Um, now, the imperialists, the capitalists of the West, were taken completely by surprise by what happened in uh, Tunisia and Egypt. The president of this country was, uh, was noticeable for his absence in those days. He didn't know what to say. He wasn't speaking. 
Um, and then he started to blabber about uh, democratic rights, and yes, the Egyptian people want to uh, have the right to govern themselves, and suddenly discovered this after having 30 years backed Mubarak, given him billions of dollars in military aid, um, and the same for other regimes. We in Marxist.com, on the other hand, as the word itself says, we're Marxists, unashamedly so. I was in a meeting in Montreal last week, and one uh, speaker said to me, are you a Marxist? And I said, yes. She said, oh, I've only met post-Marxists. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, a post-Marxist is not a Marxist. Either you're a Marxist or you're not. You accept the Marxist analysis or you don't. Um, but if you look at our website, I'm not going to read it all out, but articles from October of last year, just one sentence. Revolution is developing just beneath the surface. This is an article called Egypt, the Gathering Storm. But you go back to 2008, all the conditions are maturing for revolution, an article about Egypt. Back to 2007, um, where we talk about the working classes on the move, gaining confidence. We've been analyzing this situation throughout. <coughs> One, uh, and th there was a massive wave of strikes in Egypt over the last four or five years, which prepared this situation. So it's not you know, a bolt of lightning from a clear blue sky. That might, it might be to Obama or the bourgeois who actually begin to believe their own propaganda. And that's a problem for them because then they start losing sight of reality. The Economist is brilliant. Bourgeois magazine, which represents the interests of the American the British bourgeois. And when you read it, you see really the cold-blooded opinion of, of the bourgeois class. One of their recent <coughs> editorials on, on Britain, it's, it's, just, it's, it's really clear telling the government what it's got to do, which is to continue attacking uh, the working class. But the economist, imagine, with all, all the experts they've got, I'm sure their wages are a lot higher than ours. Um, and they got, uh, on the 6th of January, talking about Tunisia, they said, Tunisia's troubles are unlikely to unseat the 74-year-old president. This is on the 6th of January. And then added, or even to jolt his model of autocracy. It took about a week, I think before he got his one first class single ticket to Saudi Arabia. But when Tunisia fell, the BBC made the same mistake about Egypt. Egypt's different, you see. Egypt, I thought, what's different about Egypt? Pyramids? I don't know. Um, Egypt is different because it's more backward, less developed than Tunisia. So you see, in Tunisia you can't have a revolution, you couldn't have it because it was too advanced. In Egypt you can't have it because it's too backward, um, and not enough internet and too many illiterate people, this kind of stuff. Every excuse was good to explain away the revolution. The BBC correspondent said, the Tunisian revolution will not spread to Egypt. And of course, we all know what happened. I don't have to repeat all that. Now, th this revolution, uh, both the Tunisian and the Egyptian revolution, sparked a wave of revolutions across the whole Arab world and beyond. We've had movements in Azerbaijan, Djibouti, um, as I said, it had an echo even in Wisconsin. Obviously, the conditions are local, but there's a connection there within the general crisis of world capitalism. Now, what we saw in Tunisia and Egypt confirms the Marxist analysis of revolutions. First of all, revolution is not a national phenomenon. A revolution takes place usually when there's an international crisis because no single country is isolated from the rest of the world economy. And therefore, the conditions which matured in Tunisia were also maturing in Egypt, but also in Yemen, in Jordan, in Syria, in Libya, even in Morocco. We've had movements at different levels, with different degrees of success as well. But the whole area was shaken. One revolution spread to another country. That confirms what we say that revolution is international. Another thing it confirmed is how powerful the mass movement is. Once the mass of people move, in, 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 you know, they're, 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 with, with, with a firm decision to uh, topple the regime, and how did it do that? These people weren't armed, they didn't have guns, it wasn't terrorism. Look, look at all these decades of terrorism have achieved nothing in the Middle East. Um, an uprising of the masses, Ben Ali and Mubarak are removed within a few weeks. And it confirms how the bourgeois state can literally collapse in the face of a mass movement. After all, Engels explained, the state is fundamentally armed bodies of men. But if those armed bodies of men 
start to think and disobey orders. Why? Because they instinctively move to support the class they come from. Then the state is finished. And what we had, we saw this in Tunisia and Egypt. Of course, it also confirmed, this is, this is the positive side of things. In the negative, what else does it show? It also shows that although a mass movement can overthrow even the most brutal dictators, in both Egypt and Tunisia, we still have the same regime in power. The army is in control of Egypt. This is not a new army, it's the generals of Mubarak that's in power. They step in, remove Mubarak, as he's a sacrificial lamb almost to the masses, we're throwing him out to try and appease the masses and hold down the movement. They're failing to do so because once the masses have a taste of their own power, like they have in a country like Egypt, workers are raising all kinds of demands, building new trade unions, even building parties, the Democratic Labour Party, demanding nationalization where the companies have been privatized, demanding uh, better conditions. Because the revolution was not what Obama thinks or tries to portray simply about democracy. Democracy is something we support, but it's a means to an end, not the end in itself. After all, we have democracy in the United States, but the Wisconsin workers felt they had more to say than simply vote um, once every five years. We have democracy in Britain, but on the 26th of March, 800,000 workers came out on a demonstration, the biggest in trade union demonstration in history. So democracy is a means in which, of course, you can organize, you have the right to strike, the right to assembly, the um, right to protest. But when the economic conditions are such that the levels of poverty, unemployment, etc., mean that the masses want to struggle for something better. And that's the problem the bourgeois are facing in the Arab world and internationally. How do you hold back that process which has been unleashed in, in, in the Arab world? And they were desperately looking for a way of intervening. They could not intervene in Tunisia. The French offered their help. The French minister was on holiday at Christmas, offered Ben Ali some advice on how to uh, hold down the movement, which embarrassed the French later. Um, <coughs> they've, they, they, they're thinking of how, how to pull it back. And the, what the imperialists have decided in places like Tunisia and Egypt is that they have to accept the revolution but they have to try and pull it back in gradually and channel it down safe lines, which is bourgeois democratic elections, try and bring the workers back in from protest. But they're not gonna they're not gonna succeed in that. The military, when they took over in Egypt, tried to impose a strike ban and it just flopped. They couldn't. You can't impose such a thing on the on the Egyptian working class that's in that's moving forward, not backwards. But they're, they're maneuvering. In Egypt, they're talking to the Muslim Brotherhood. They're trying all kinds of, trying to fill the vacuum. The tragedy is, there isn't a workers' party, and there isn't a workers' leadership um, in these <coughs> countries that could complete this revolution. Because who can deny that if in Tunisia or Egypt, the workers, instead of simply overthrowing the dictator, had used that immense power to overthrow the whole regime and they had the rank and file of the army with them. They had the police in Tunisia, forming a union and backing the masses. All the conditions were there for a, de a genuine revolution. And imagine if Tunisia and Egypt had gone all the way, or well, you wouldn't have the confusion that we have today in Libya, for example, or in Syria. You wouldn't have the situation in Bahrain. In Bahrain, what is possible is the Saudis, they've managed to hold down them, the, the beginnings of a movement there, and they're brutally oppressing and dis uh, you know, attacking the, the Bahraini revolution. Um, the imperialists were looking for an excuse to step in. And on this, Libya provided that excuse, which they couldn't have done in Tunisia and Egypt. Now in Libya, what we saw was the spread of the revolution. The, the movement in Tunisia and Egypt seemed relatively easy. Now I'm saying that, in a certain, I think they killed was it 800 people, I think, in Egypt? And in Tunisia, several hundred too were killed. So when I mean by relatively easy, I mean it, took, it didn't take much to bring down the regime or to get rid of the dictator. And the idea developed, you can see it, especially amongst the youth. Egypt shows the way. All you've got to do is go on Facebook and Twitter, fix the day and the time and the place, call a mass rally, build up a mass movement, 
and sooner or later the regime